The Behemoth Brewing Company presents the Department of Conversation with Pat Brittenden. Behemoth, give me something hoppy. Is the Behemoth, look at the levels going up and down with Jimmy Nish and Behemoth Brewing Company and the Department of Conversation. Jimmy, thanks for that. Thanks for sticking with us for that technical glitch. It's just good to be here on the ground floor, just seeing everything happen as it happens. It's funny, we had this conversation before we actually even uh, start talking. And you're like, oh, tell us about the equipment and how it works. And I say, you know, we don't stop live streaming ever unless there's a monumental balls up and what happens right now there's a monumental balls up and the audio decides not to work but it's working i can see it working i can see the levels going up and down i can see your beautiful blue steel and we are rocking and rolling thanks for joining us i appreciate it no pleasure pleasure to see the inner workings dude let me say to start with last night amazing game so much fun to watch um yeah your thoughts at the end of the game um oh look it's obviously always extremely pleasing first game of a series to come out and have a strong uh showing in the first game um the aussies are obviously one of our, our massive rivals in world cricket so for them to come over obviously in these times and, and do their two weeks quarantine and and come out and get into the series is is good for cricket globally and good for new zealand cricket and um, we're looking forward to a competitive rest of the series hopefully more wins for us but um, we're sure that they'll come back um, stronger after that defeat in the first game. You guys must have been pretty stoked, though, because on the uh, on the T20 um, chart at the moment, like the countdown, I mean, New Zealand number one uh, test, wahoo, about number three in ODIs, I think, behind India and another team, but about number six in T20 in the rankings, and I think Australia number three. So it must feel good to look at uh, a team like that who is uh, who the numbers are saying are ranked up more higher at the moment and it's not just a win that was a that was an assault last night that was an, a demolition it was amazing yeah i i think we're i don't think i'm out of line saying we're probably in the strongest era of new zealand cricket in history at the moment as you said the rankings are, are right up there t20 cricket is such a hit and miss game sometimes yeah, right. and and I think we've especially used T20 cricket as a, I suppose, a format to blood a few younger guys and give a few younger guys chances when guys like Trent and Tim and Kane have rests at the end of long summers. So um, potentially that lower ranking is, is indicative of that a little bit. But um, certainly now with a, a T20 World Cup coming up um, at the end of this year, uh, it's a lot more about um, trying to find our best team and give our strongest 11 the, the opportunities possible. And, and the goal then is, is to win as many games as possible. Do you personally enjoy one form over the other? Like, do you have a, a favourite test one day of T uh, Twenty? Um, I was actually talking about this with Brendan McCullum this morning. Actually, it's sort of a bit like eating. You know, you you don't want to have fast food all the time, and right. you also don't feel like having steak. You know, for every dinner either. So I, I find that um, a balance is best. Obviously, we've got a lot of T Twenty cricket currently due to the the World T Twenty coming up at the end of the year. So that's going to be our focus. Um, over the next little while, but no, I certainly love love all the formats. I'm not playing Test cricket at the moment for New Zealand, which is um, not ideal. But yeah, hopefully I'll be able to uh, fight my way back in in the future. Are you becoming? Because uh, this is your the, the thing that's interesting to talk to someone about. You like those of us who have been sort of hackers and played cricket when we we're younger and that kind of stuff and had fun or whatever sport are that. But this is also your profession. It's your job in that. And and for your job, um, do you think? I, so I'm thinking about other jobs, like if you were, uh, like my background is radio announcer, you know, there are some people who will always be the afternoon guys or the evening guys. There's only a few who will ever be the breakfast guys sort of thing. Is, is there a point in a, in, in a cricketer's career, maybe in your career, where you kind of go, test cricket is now not the focus, but the shorter format stuff is? I mean, have you yourself reached that point or are you still open and hopefully looking forward to playing all of it as much as possible? Um, well, I think it's an individual basis, isn't it? I think um, for me... Uh, I think my main motivation for playing Test Cricket again is that I don't think I was a very complete player when I played the first time. I think right. I came in when I was in my early 20s, I think I was 24 or something, and um, played a lot of my Test Cricket when I was young and naive and didn't really know what I was doing. And um, I feel like I've been judged off that performance for the rest of my career, even though I'm a different player now. So um, I'd love to have another chance to, to have another go at Test Cricket as I suppose, I mean, not the finished product because no one's ever the finished product as a cricketer, but as a more complete player. Mm. Um, and if that, if I get that opportunity, um, that'd be great. But as you said, at the same time, um, I want to play for New Zealand as much as possible. I mean, at the current place where my game is, that's in white ball cricket. Um, I'm not the youngest in the group at 30, so um, that decision is probably around the corner. But 
Um, at the moment, I'm just trying to play as many games as I can for New Zealand. Um, played my 100th game yesterday, actually, oh, yesterday uh, for Amazing. New Zealand. So, um, yeah, another 100 would be nice. Uh, whether that's uh, T20s one day or tests, um, you know, that, that's to be seen. T20 seems to us also given the opportunity for um, giving some longevity to Korea. You think about people like Chris Gale, even Shane Warne came back and kind of played some T20 for a while. And maybe even Brendan McCullum is one of those guys. That shorter game, not so hard on the body perhaps I guess four overs rather than 10 or rather than 60 if you're playing in a test match um, so that does mean I mean what another 100 is completely feasible for the age you're at or any 30 year old professional to, to get through yeah well 40 is not an outlandish thought yeah. anymore in professional cricket I think um, the one that really hurts the body is backing up day after day which is obviously test cricket four day cricket um, whereas T20 tournaments even one day tournaments you generally always have a, a day between games at least and um, that gives the the more experienced players enough time to recover and get their bodies right again. And um, yeah, I mean, you see guys like Chris Gale, as you mentioned, Shane Watson played really old. Imran mm. Tahir here, still going at forty two or forty three or something. So yeah, for me, um, the rigors of international cricket, I, I'm not sure you can go much past your kind of mid to late thirties, but. Right. But yeah, the, the the franchise cricket around the world, the T20 cricket, yeah, I see no reason not to go into your early 40s if, of course, if you're still performing and, and more importantly, still enjoying it. As someone who's a professional athlete, now I'm not interested, obviously, getting into your personal business to do with finances, but as as professional athlete, is it the kind of thing that you could have an injury tomorrow that could end your career, that could end your income? Is that is that like a, I don't mean a reality like it's going to happen, but forget you, I'm talking about a professional athlete. Is that something that's actively could happen or do the contracts tend to put you up for two or three years no matter what happens to your, to your body sort of thing? No, no, contracts are one-year contracts pretty much around the world. Yeah. Um, IPL, uh, your contract isn't even worth anything if you get injured. You know, that it's not even one year if you're in the middle of the tournament. So you, if you got injured like in tomorrow's game and couldn't do the IPL, which your Mumbai Indians this mm. year, yeah, that would just be cancelled. Yeah, I'd wow. get nothing. So um, you can you know go through avenues to ensure your earnings if you want, which um, guys who earn significant amounts will do. Uh, my contract's one of the lower level contracts, so it's one of those things that you just get along and and see if you can make it. But yeah, you're right. It's one of the most uncertain things about. Uh, being a cricketer is that you can earn half a million dollars one year and then earn 40 grand the next. It's kind of one of those completely ridiculous things. Well, it's like Aaron Finch. Aaron Finch hasn't been picked up for the IVL, IPI. Hmm. So that must be a huge donk into his salary for this year versus last year. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Steve Smith got picked up in the IPL this year for, I think it was $300,000, which is obviously a, a huge amount of money, but he was $2.4 million last year. So it's sort of, you take a pay cut like that, um, you know, it's pretty, uh, I suppose, surprising you have to change your spending habits a little bit. But uh, for New Zealand cricketers, we're certainly not dealing in those sorts of numbers, yeah. but um, the principle is the same. So when you, at your age, so you'd probably be fair to say you'd be sort of mid-career. You know, guys kind of start in their early 20s, they might finish in their late 30s. So 30 would be maybe mid-career. Yep. Are you already starting to think, what next? Yep. Or are you just enjoying every day as it is right now, living the world as a professional athlete, every childhood dream sort of thing, and worrying about tomorrow, tomorrow? Um, I think I do have an idea of what I want to do next. I've, I've done a bit of a work in radio, um, presenting sort of breakfast shows and um, commentating the cricket as well. So that's certainly the, the media avenue I want to go down. And um, I think for me, you know, personally, it's probably more from a financial point of view, thinking what, like what position do I want to be in when I leave the game, mm -hmm. you know, for I don't have a family yet, but, you know, you got to try and make those are your, your prime earning years, I guess, which is unusual for someone to have their prime earning years sort of before they're 35 and then have to make that last the rest of their life. Um, so it's a position of what what sort of um, passive income and all that kind of thing do you want to leave the game with and you know mortgages and that kind of thing. So that's certainly something we plan. Like we get quite good support from um, New Zealand Cricket Players Association around uh, financial advisors and, and those sorts of things that sort of um, let you know where you should be trying to be and um, yeah, that certainly becomes a bit of a focus, as you mentioned, um, the second half of your career. Because there's horrific stats. I mean, we talk about American professional sports numbers. <laughs> you, you, there's something like in it, like 80% or something of NFL players are bankrupt within four years of leaving the game sort of thing. So New Zealand cricket has like a, 
a, a, a hey guys this is what like a business mentor business advice for your money as you go through yeah exactly and you know uh, financial advisors and there's also um cricketers trust funds for people that go on uh, cricketers hardship funds sorry uh, for people who go you know onto hard times and, and the such but um there's certainly i feel like in our current black caps environment the guys are quite au fait with uh, financial planning and investing that kind of thing that's just, it's a topic of conversation that comes up quite a lot amongst guys um so i think everyone's sort of got those goals moving forward i think i would like to think that our um, team is probably better place to avoid those sorts of statistics than say an nfl team or an nba team yeah i guess the other thing with those when you're getting paid 30 million a season you live that lifestyle typically don't mm. you and then when you go down to only a million a season that's that's a that's a significant the difficult drop to take sort of thing so yeah yeah hey um i wanted to ask you about devin conway from yesterday when he got into the dressing rooms on his 99 night out uh, how was he how how was he walking through was he like stoked to have uh participated and, and give so much to the team or was he like oh shit just missed out um no nah, he's he's gonna score plenty of hundreds in his life eh? <laughs> so um yeah look he he was coming off obviously our bowlers were all running out onto the field to warm up for the for the second inning so we didn't see a whole lot of um what he looked like um getting his pads off or anything but no dev's a a consummate team player um playing with him at wellington obviously i've seen him score plenty of runs and, and i've also seen him have the odd rare game where he doesn't score any and uh, for him it's all about the team and um i think he you know would have been thinking more about how we could have got more than 180 rather than how he could have got more than 99 so um that's a credit to him and um he'll just be happy coming down here with a win and, and one nil up in the series and there's plenty of worse days out than 99 not out. I was thinking this afternoon, I was because I was going to ask you about that question, and I was thinking about when Martin Crow got 299. I actually remember I was watching that test match when he when he got it, and I remember he walked, but he got out on 299, so it's a bit different. It wasn't the last ball. But walking down the stadium, walking into the stadium and just throwing his bat into his room, he's like obviously just annoyed with himself that he couldn't be the first to make that make that um, transition to a triple, you know, century i had a look for it online i actually found the clip on youtube and i think it's quite nice whoever's uploaded it to youtube whatever whether it was tv or Z, has actually moved the graphics to not see him throwing his bat in the thing now you can hear a clunk hmm. but you don't see him do it and I, I actually kind of i think that's kind of nice because obviously he was just annoyed with himself and he didn't obviously want to you know put it out there i also wanted to ask you though about finn allen um obviously you played with him in wellington he seems to be phenomenal he seems to be a nice. bit like Conway, and everywhere he goes, runs, follow. I know I don't want to ask you about selection prices. It's not your gig, but it will be exciting when we see him in a black cap shirt, whether that's in a couple of days, couple of weeks, couple of months, whatever it's going to be. Yeah, uh, he's he's new. That's the thing. It's kind of, uh, he's only, I think, 20 or maybe even just turned 21. But um, it, it's one of those things he's come in. He actually had a really rough start to the season for Wellington in four-day cricket um you know didn't score many runs had a concussion um had a bit of a, a couple of setbacks and then to come out in the the t20s and and bat the way he's batted has been phenomenal and um yeah whether you know he should have been picked on the team or whatever you know it's not my place to say yeah, but not a conversation I'll um, have with you. yeah he'll get a chance at some point you know it's inevitable i mean with the i think it's a 20-man squad that goes to the t20 world cup i've got no doubt that he'll be given a chance at some point to show what he's got and I think it's important to recognise for a player like that that if he does come up and get a chance for the Black Caps and doesn't go well, it actually doesn't mean he's not a good player. You know, he could easily go back to domestic cricket and figure things out and then come up again. Well, you just got. Um, I always think about John Alomo. You know, he hmm. got he got put on the wing at eighteen by the and got kind of turned around by the French lot. Didn't really do very much, and then came back to be, you know, hmm. one of the greatest, most famous wingers the rugby's ever seen. So, and that uh, that's the story for a lot of. Uh, I think Brendan McCullum was thrown to the wolves against Australia when he first started and didn't go very well and got dropped. I mean, I got thrown to the South Africans in South Africa <laughs> and didn't go well and got dropped. You know, it's a sort of it's almost a rite of passage as a as an international sportsman where no one's the finished product coming through and um he'll have areas of his game that he has weaknesses in and they'll be found out and, and that's sort of part of the process is well, a question well of that's how a part of the back. part of what i was going to ask as well it seems that sometimes when a a new and exciting player comes on be they a bowler or a batter because then those weaknesses aren't quite known yet hmm. that maybe they have a one or two spectacular seasons and then the if they're a batsman the bowlers have worked them out a bit if they're a bowler the batsmen have worked them out a bit and 
and uh, like uh, I, I think Shane Bond was obviously an unbelievable talent and one of the if not the best fast fast bowler we've ever had one of the top up there but he seemed to have that as well you come in and you, and you and you hit the ground running and it takes a while to work you out which I think also just goes to show the the quality of um, Southie and Bolt at the moment, because they seem, Southie in particular, and I'm, I don't want to, I'm not an expert in this, but it seems that he had a bit of a lean patch for a while, but now, especially watching last night, they are the preeminent world swing bowlers, especially opening, and given the right conditions, no one can touch them. Hmm. And, and their longevity seems that the batsmen haven't worked them out. Yeah. So they seem to be the opposite, which must go to what makes a great player. Yeah. And, and Tim got dropped, you know, yeah. that's sort of, uh, that Trent, I'm not sure if Trent ever got dropped, but there was certainly a period where there were question marks around him, around white ball cricket especially. You know, he's playing test cricket and going well, but potentially hadn't quite figured out the one-day game. So every player has their challenges as they come through, especially when they're that young. I think Tim was picked at 19 and, and Trent probably 20. So it's, um, you know, everyone has their their lean patches and it's, that's just part of developing as a cricketer. And I suppose that's how you find out who goes on to to be the all-time greats and who sort of falls by the wayside it's it's less so about what you what player you were when you came into international cricket it's more so about how well you managed to adapt and and become you know stronger in those weak areas because i think a lot of people don't understand is that you can be a great batsman and have some great strengths but ultimately in international cricket you're measured by how strong your weakest point is Mm. if you can't play the short ball you're going to get bounced every time you bat if you can't play spin they're going to bring a spinner on as soon as you come out every inning. So it actually becomes more of a challenge of how well-rounded you can be as a cricketer rather than you know how well you can smack seam bowlers at the top of the innings, you know? Because, I mean, you know, Finn's shown an ability to dominate um, seam bowling, but, I mean, he's still untested in spinning conditions against spinners and yeah, that yeah. sort of thing. So that'll be an area of his game that he'll have to prove that he's competent at before he can sort of make that next step. As someone who's actively just said you're not part of the test team at the moment, I guess you are an insider, but you're also an outsider because you weren't involved in the last test series. What do you think about what New Zealand's doing with test cricket at the moment? I mean, because I'm, I'm, I'm older than you by a, a long way, and I look back to the 1980s and I can remember the cans on Eden Park for Hadley running in and Cairns and Sneddon and Chatfield. You know, those were my kind of, when I was a 10-year-old looking at my heroes, that's who they were sort of thing. And I think they got to number two in the world in the 80s, I think. Um, now number one in the world. How do you, how do you look at it as someone who who was inside but also wasn't actively playing the test game as to what that Black Caps team has done and are doing? Well, I think it's phenomenal. I think uh, when you look back to um, when Brendan McCullum took over as captain, in, I think it was 2014, um, bowled out for for 40 or something in Cape Town and and basically embarrassed on that tour, and um, that was sort of a bit of a low point and. Um, to have a, I suppose, a clean out and, and a real change of philosophy and, and change of personnel after that, and then six, seven years later, to the number one test team in the world, it's actually unbelievable if you think about it. And um, we've gone from, you know, struggling to to put away teams like Bangladesh and West Indies in those sorts of conditions to to basically being hot favourites every time there's a test on New Zealand soil, no matter who it's against. You know, putting India away two nil and um, competing against some really strong sides, it's it's phenomenal when you think about it, and um, yeah, to be a, a an observer, but also yeah, part of it, mm. it's quite a strange position to be in. But um, I suppose it all comes to a head in, in a couple of months in the World Test Championship final, and um, we still don't know who that'll be against. Um, hopefully, I'll be there, the big squad for that tour, so I'm a chance of being involved. But um, yeah, it'll be really, I suppose, a culmination of all that hard work over a, a very, very long time. Do you personally have any objectives or targets that you want to achieve? Like, as a team, a target to be the number one test playing team in the world. Tick that box. You know, I was just thinking about Trent Bolt. I think there's an ANZ advert where he says, you know, I want to be New Zealand's um, highest wicket taker sort of thing. He's got a, a, a an objective there. Do you have anything for you that you want to achieve in the game that's tangible? Um, I don't personally. I think as a as an all-rounder, um, you, you need to be as adaptable as possible to the situation and um for example last night on the t20 coming out with dev and having to try and generate a strike rate early and try and keep the momentum of the innings i feel like if i was thinking i need i want to score a certain number of runs in my career i feel like that goal would actually be detrimental to what right. is required for the team at that point right. so for me it's just about winning games of cricket if i can 
um go out make a contribution even if it's 14 off six you know as a as a number six and walk off and then we get an above par score and end up winning like i feel like that's a significant contribution i've made to the team and and guys the guys at the top of the order like dev and cypher are always gonna be the guys who have the opportunity to score the most runs simply from the fact that they get the opportunity to face the most ball sure um but that contribution uh, uh you know sometimes coming on to bowl in the sixth over when a team's charging and managing to only go for nine is actually a really significant contribution in the game whereas mm-hmm. it doesn't show up on the on the score sheet or it doesn't count as a wicket so i think that's what i try and focus on as an all-rounder is, is looking at the end of the day and going did i make the moves that i could today to try and shift the needle as far as our win chance slightly towards the positive and if i did that then i consider that a success and whether you get the game changer award or the any of that kind of crap or people talk about you in the paper the next day is irrelevant because internally in the group you know that you were doing something positive for the team and you took a screamer of a catch so that's up there as well that was a great yeah. catch last night and yeah. I, I know that and and you wouldn't have heard this because i was obviously watching the commentary you know the guys were talking about martin gupton on the commentary yesterday he didn't have a, he didn't have a good game yesterday batting but they're like he will every game he'll save you 10 runs mm. he'll change the way that happens he'll contribute on the field because he's such a phenomenal fielder as well so hmm. i get what you're what you're saying yeah and that's a perfect example is even during the world cup a couple of years ago or last year three years ago whatever it was um have you wiped that from the memory the world yeah cup, i'm trying it's, it's proving more <laughs> difficult than i initially thought um he didn't have a very good tournament yet he was one of the reasons we we're in the final because he ran ms Doney out in the semi-final and won the game for us you know it's those little moments yeah. where those are the hours of practice that you put in for the group and no one will i'm sure he'll be happy for me saying this no one will look back at the world cup and go martin gupta was important to new zealand's success in that tournament Mm -hmm. but as a group we know he was because every team every game in the field he was saving runs and significant run outs catches that sort of thing which is sometimes not one of the things people talk about after the game because other guys are scoring runs and taking wickets or whatever but still important to the to the group um I wanted to ask you about the game yesterday because it was on quite a significant anniversary, obviously, 22nd, 10-year anniversary of the quake. And uh, Hagley Park was one of the first anchor, I think it was the first anchor thing that they did in Christchurch to bring back some normality to life, you know, meaning uh, we'll give you back your sport, sport being so massive to Cantabrians and that massive day. What was the feeling like amongst the players and, and in the and in the, in the in the stadium? Because there must have been a... I mean, yeah, there was a moment of silence, but was it obvious that this was a different feel to it, this game, or was it just sport as usual? It's my job, put my job hat on, do game. Um, it's a bit of a mixture, to be honest. Um, obviously, the moment of silence, national anthems, all that kind of thing sort of adds to the sense of occasion. Um, Kane and, and Aaron went down to the to the memorial service um, during the day and, and laid flowers and, and sort of things. So it was certainly in the back of our minds. But yeah, as you say it's it's you're doing your job you know we we actually um unusually didn't have any cantabrians on the squad um for the game yesterday so there was no one who was actually there you know in canterbury at the time so um we felt we were a little bit detached from that perspective but um no certainly you want to you know anytime you play in front of the canterbury crowd there's such parochial supporters of sport that you want to sort of do them proud because they really get in behind you and they give the other team stick and you know chant and mexican waves and all that sort of things so you sort of do feel like you should reward them with a good performance <laughs> um so i wanted to ask you as well i i saw some footage of you yesterday when you were talking to uh, uh i think tim cyford and the slips you guys were having a chat away and i wondered for myself i would have brought up the video but i, I, haven't, got, I haven't i haven't got the place saved exactly where it was when you're in the slips and you're having that conversation what are the conversations is it purely cricket or is it anything but cricket uh oh, a bit of a mixture um yeah i, I think uh tim Seifert was on the mic uh last night yeah after right. the commentators so i think we were talking about how he was seen to be overly focused on the weather to, uh, of the day rather than what was actually going on in the game so we were you know calling him jim hickey and all this sort of thing <laughs> in the corner and didn't know jim hickey was taking the gloves for the black caps tonight and <laughs> that sort of thing so uh, it's often uh just sort of banter like that and then sometimes you sort of think about what you think is about to happen what what shots you think guys are going to play or the field or whatever because um even though kane is the captain he does often sort of ask of some of the uh i suppose more experienced guys what they think around bowling changes and that sort of thing so right. it always pays to be 
having one eye on the game and what you think should be happening is it i mean it must be more difficult during a test match and i mean you, you have played test matches do you do you wonder i mean if you're out in the field for two days it must be hard just to stay focused all the time i imagine a t20 game you'd you'd blink and you'd miss it you know like it would be all of a sudden you're at the 13th over and where did that game go but mm. the, the the do you do you wonder in a test match if you're fielding yeah definitely and i think that's probably part of the skill of it is actually letting your mind wander at times when <laughs> right. it's not needed and and then sort of coming back in and switching back on because I mean nobody can concentrate for for eight hours on the on the bounce. So um, it is about we call it switching on, switching off. Um, I've in the past had trouble with the the switching back on part of that equation, <laughs> but I think that's one of the things all young guys go through when they come in. So um, yeah, it's just one of those things you need to you, you sort of loosely stay keyed into what's going on, but then you do let your mind wander into the crowd or, or whatever's going on. Now someone told me as well that you have a nut allergy. Is that right? Is it like a full serious nut allergy? Like a EpiPen if you get the wrong thing kind of deal? That was an interesting segue. Uh, <laughs> no, no, just uh, illness. Not Well, not death. No. Just sort of sickness, yeah. So um, I don't need like a nut-free kitchen or anything like that. Um, just, I know I know someone that if the uh, if there's a jar of peanut butter open, they can't go into the room. Hmm. So yeah, it's no, pretty full I'm, on. I'm not that um, over the top. I tell you what, there's a series of questions coming out now, and you say interesting segue, but I'm just kind of going. It's it's. I've got a professional cricket player sitting in front of me. These are the questions I've always sort of wanted to ask a professional cricket player. Mm. When you hear a commentator say, "Oh, they placed that beautifully in the gap," you know, between two fielders, how accurate can you be as a batsman to place it in that gap, or is it that you're hitting it in the general area and it goes in the gap? Because the way the commentators state it it was aimed for that gap and they hit it in that gap um so for me fields are generally the same yep you know if i face an off spinner i'll have long on long off both out guy on the sweep guy deep cover two backward points a cover and a mid wicket so i know exactly where guys are going to be at all times it's very unusual that you get out there and a captain will have a different plan where he has two mid wickets or you know whatever mm -hmm. so when I'm batting in the nets, I'm always thinking, okay, if I get a ball there, ah. I should be looking to hit it in that direction. So if, you, if, than... if you're practicing against an off spinner, in mm. your head you're going, this is the field they're going to set for me, this is where I want to try and learn to be able to hit it to. Yeah. Ah. So it, often to me, um, seam bowling at the death will either have mid off up or cow corner up. Yeah. One of those two. So when you're training, you're looking to either go give yourself room and go over long off or get inside and go over mid wicket. And you always know at training, if you hit it too straight or too square, there's going to be fielders there. So it's a bit of a risk. So it's sort of that whole honing of your technique of knowing where guys are going to be and always thinking, is that in the gap? No, I need to be square, you know, whatever. And, and it becomes a, I suppose, a challenge of that's where the pitching conditions come into play because sometimes, and you might be facing an off spinner and you know there's going to be a gap at mid wicket but the, the nature of the pitch is turning and bouncing, so that becomes a really difficult area to hit. So they're trying to get you to hit there, and you're trying to avoid hitting there, so it becomes a bit of a game in and of itself. And um, Yeah, it's certainly one of the things about being adaptable. And, and I think that's when you come into your scouting and we always talk about what sort of slow balls different guys have and, and all that sort of thing. And it's about if you can be one step ahead of the game, even half a step ahead of the game where you look up and you see the field and you go, okay, this guy's probably going to bowl this now. Mm -hmm. And then you're just a little bit ahead and then it gives you that chance because things are happening so quickly. Like you guys are coming and bowling 145 kilometers an hour. You don't have time to go, oh, okay, that's outside off and oh, where are those fielders? Oh, okay, there's one there and one there. I'll try and hit it in the gap. Like it needs to be a, a more visceral kind of bang, you know, something you're prepared for. It, it, it reminds me of, of a game of poker, you know, that you play certain cards a certain way, but one of the things you can do sometimes to shake up a game is you sort of do the opposite. And and, and I mean, don't, I don't mean kind of like buffeted playing strong cards, weak and weak cards, strong. That's a fairly obvious thing. But if you've got a certain set of cards, you typically will or won't raise depending on where the flop comes in before before the flop happens and at the turn or at the river or whatever. Is there a, could there be a theory in captain, captaincy then that because you're supposed to have, supposed to have a particular field for an off spinner to actually not give you that field for the off spinner therefore the thousand times you've tried to place the ball through mid off or whatever because you've got a gap there actually now there's a person there hmm. or or as a international cricketer top line cricketer yourself and others 
are the skill set good enough that you can change on a dime? And now that they've moved the field around, you would then just change to try and aim it to the place that still hasn't got someone, even though it's where you were expecting someone. Well, certainly that's part of the game. So for me, I bowl a lot at the death. And there are guys who will try and play a scoop shot, which goes over a short fine leg if fine leg's up. So sometimes you'll be bowling at death and you know you have to have fine leg back because this is a strength of his is that he will play the scoop shot that goes to fine leg. Mm -hmm. So that's something he's looking for. So you have to have fine leg back. But sometimes you have the thought where you go, okay, I'm actually going to bring fine leg up. I know he's going to play the scoop shot. I'm 95% sure. He's looking there, he's going, oh, fine leg's up. This is my strength. I'm going to go to it. So then you try and bowl something that's like a wide slower ball or a slower ball bumper or something that you know is more difficult to play off that shot. So you almost play into a guy's strengths to trap them into doing something that you know they're going to do. Wow. So you sort of, you know, guys like A.B. de Villiers obviously is a fantastic player. But you can get a read on him because he's got all the shots in the book. He can literally just look up and go, okay, where's the field? Okay, there's no guy there. I'm going to hit it there. So you actually know he's going to make take that option. So then you can make it more difficult for him. And he's actually one of the rare guys who's so good, he can actually then adapt again while the ball's coming down and readjust. But a lot of guys, well, you'll bring a guy up and you know they're going to try and charge. You know, a bit to a spinner, you bring mid on up and you know a guy's going to charge and try and hit you over the top. So then you can sort of play with that. And that's something Brendan McCullum was very, very good at yeah. when he was captain, was playing guys' egos and um, letting guys, bowling to guys' strengths, but then plugging the strength and saying, okay, well, if you're so good at this, then let's see it you know and playing on the ego and guys often would get too overconfident and get out as a bowler what should be a fan's expectation of your level of accuracy as to where you're trying to bowl you know you see a you see a field set for a certain particular board let's say it's it's wide and on that on that um wide line that's what this field is set to and they miss their mark a few times like should we as fans expect a, a first class professional international bowler to be able to hit that mark three quarters of the time half the time all the time what because it does seem a lot of the time that a, a ball will come out of a bowler's hand that's obviously not meant for the field that's set so one would think maybe there's been a there's been an error in the delivery or are mm. you saying that's more likely that that's like a double bluff well you can i mean double bluffs obviously part of the game i think to give a bit of perspective so if we're doing yorker training mm -hmm. and we're bowling at a cone if you're hitting that cone two times out of six that's a pretty good effort. Wow, okay. So, it, it, I mean, when people go, oh, why don't they bowl more Yorkers? Yeah, yeah. It's actually hard. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's, the thing's 22 yards away, you're running in at full pace, letting a ball go above your head with a straight arm to yeah. get it to land on a thing this big. And the reality is, with the way batsmen hit the ball these days, is that is your target. If you miss by more than that, it's probably going out of the ground. Well, actually, stop sorry to so, interrupt you, but I think I've heard Brendan McCullum say that if the ball landed in like a square about this big, he'd defend it. Anything else, he'd try to put over the boundary. Hmm. So. Exactly. <laughs> so, And that's the margin we're talking about. So, And that's what... The thing... I'm going to go a little bit off topic here. Sure. The thing that annoys me so much about when commentators go, why aren't they bowling Yorkers? Why aren't they bowling Yorkers? Is that the Yorker is a, a self-fulfilling kind of thing where if you bowl a ball that doesn't get scored off... <laughs> people think it's a Yorker. If you right. bowl a ball that gets hit for six, people go, that's not a Yorker. Oh, like it was a, that was a good length to get the bat under. Exactly. Yeah. So if I try and bowl a Yorker yeah. and I miss short by two feet, but the batsman charges and it's a Yorker, yeah, right. they go, great Yorker. So the, so the, you know? the, the, the batsman has an amount of uh, power as to what the mm. ball is defined because if they're deep in their crease, well, they charge. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And if I bowl a perfect Yorker, and a guy gets down on one knee and slogs over six of a square leg. Yeah. Everyone goes, "It's a full toss." Yeah, right. Even though it was gonna be a, a low perfect, full toss. yeah. Even yeah. though it was gonna be a perfect Yorker if yeah, the guy yeah. had stood still. So then you get all these things at the end of games where people go, "Oh, New Zealand only bowled fourteen Yorkers, and the opposition only scored twelve runs off them." Right. Whereas everything else, the opposition struck at one hundred and eighty, and it's like, well, that's actually not correct. But they only scored twelve runs off fourteen balls you coded as a Yorker. There were actually another seven balls that were Yorkers that all went for six, but you said they were either full tosses or half volleys based right. on where the batsman moved to. So, and obviously, when you release the ball, you don't know where the batsman's going to be when the ball gets there. You know, they'll be moving, they'll be might be scooping you or charging or whatever. So, the case of oh, Yorker tick, it's actually that's not the reality. The the it's an attempted Yorker, and then depending on where the batsman ends up, yep, it ends up looking good or looking terrible. So that that's just one little. 
nitpick I have around no, that's a, cricket we, punditry. We, we like a nitpick. Hmm. Okay, here's something that I've asked a few All Blacks and ex-All Blacks that have come in. I'd like to ask you the same sort of thing. Uh, who do you think is, and it's a, it's a, it's a bit more of a peculiar question, I think, to a cricketer than a rugby player because every rugby player on the field has somewhat a similar skill set. They do a similar thing, but the 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 line of demarcation between batting and bowling can be quite dramatic. But if I was to say to you, the greatest player you think there's ever been, and then I was to say to you, the greatest player you have played with or against, do any names come to mind? Jacques Callas is the greatest player that's ever been. Wow. Because he had it all, because he had the batting and the bowling as well. He had Sachin Tendulkar's batting record and then took 300 wickets as well. That's, so that's that's actually an easy answer for you. Yeah. For me, I mean, as an all-rounder, for of a man to, to bat three... Bowl the overs he did at the pace he did, take the number of wickets he did, play with the longevity that he did, two hundred and something catches in Test cricket. Uh, how many thousand? Must more than ten thousand runs, I would think. And you guys would have crossed over. Did you ever play against them? Uh, we we played around the same time. Right. I don't think we ever actually played against each other. I think uh, when I played South Africa, I think he was resting that series or, or maybe even injured or something. But yeah, he he's overlooked. I feel as as one of the all time greats. It's just the physical difficulty of of carrying those loads yeah. for that long. I think is is unbelievable. You look at basically every every other rounder that's ever been. You know, Andrew Flintoffs, you know, Chris Cairns, is you know all those sorts of guys. The injuries left, right, and centre mm. just because it's so physically demanding. Mm. And yet he was just a rock and played. I mean, I don't know off the top of my head how many tests he played. It was more than a hundred, I think. Hundred. Yeah. 30 or something like that well i was going to say he doesn't seem to get a mention i mean he gets mm. a mention of being one of the greats but but you're i think he is undervalued perhaps mm. what about this then and i'll give you the example that i've used in rugby most exciting player you've ever seen might not be the best player and the example i used to give actually when i'm talking cricket i used to talk about jesse Ryder because you'd never know quite what would happen but mm. in cricket for me it's always been christian cullen not, not maybe not maybe the greatest ever but when he touched the ball magic always happened Think of someone that, like, the reason I used to talk about Jesse Ryder, I think Jesse, when he actually out and opened with Guppy as well, I think, yep. I would love watching the start of the innings. It would be the highlight just to watch the start of the innings with those two going. Mm. What What about you? I don't hopefully I haven't taken one off you there, but the most exciting player you've ever seen? Um, well, for, I'll go back and I'll go for a very, very brief moment in time, Rapini Thatha Nabutha. Oh, from rugby, yeah, yeah for was, sure. Was yep. the most elite. That's who, you know what? That's who, that's who Grant Fox picked as well. Yeah. Yep. Uh, well, we're great minds, <laughs> me and Foxy. Um, cricket, most exciting player. Uh, I, very hard to go past David de Villiers. Right, yeah, of course. Very hard to go past David de Villiers. Uh, in modern day, um, I'll tell you, there's a, a lesser known name is Nicholas Puran from, don't, from don't the West know. Indies. Okay. He, he plays in the IPL. He's one of the most unbelievable ball strikers I've, I've ever seen. Um, and yeah, I think one of those two, but yeah. A.B. de Villiers is, is a different level. I think we're coming to a time we've got to wrap up. There's one thing I wanted to ask you. <clears throat> one thing I kind of prepared properly for. Ah. Do you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure you do this. I'm sure you, I'm a, are you a golfer? Yep. Yeah, okay. You know when you're at the you're up at the tee and, you're, and you've got your, your driver and you hit it and you hit it perfect and it's mm. got that sound mm. and it's got that flight line that goes in, it takes off and you know you've hit it perfect. Yeah. So if you could pick one of these, I want to, I want to know from you which is the most satisfying in cricket, right? Do you know that over the I see I I remember this the over you scored thirty four in, you hit about three or four sixes. Yeah. But one of them was on the roof. Yeah. So obviously that came off the bat differently from the others. That was the shot I thought about when you started. Okay. Well there you go. It had the it had the target. It had the had a different fire. So if you had to pick one of these, the most satisfying thing is it the the perfect six off the bat that has that sound? Uh, Is it knocking a stump out of the ground when bowling like a perfect ball York or whatever it is, but it sends the stump flying. Is it the the Maddie Sinclair catch, the perfect catch on the boundary where you're flying and the whole crowd goes crazy, or is it that um, point where you uh, have one wicket to aim at from the side, you know, hit it perfectly, run them out? So they're all sort of these parts of the game that are that are the equivalent of that sound. You know, they've got something about mm. it. Which one of those things would be most satisfying to you? Um, I think the catch. Really? I, I think when you when you're mid air. And you're at full stretch, and because you know, as soon as it, you don't even have to have your eyes open, you can feel it. It just almost like suckers in there, like a, I don't know, a plunger or something. But I, I would say that the catch in the semi final of the World Cup 
sort of diving full stretch and it just you see it go in perfectly and that's in a significant moment in a game i feel like that's you know hard to go past so yeah i guess that's a caveat isn't it so if they were all at significant moments you'd mm. pick the the catch over all the other ones oh <laughs> well, see, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to go past the six and it the is super hard over. isn't it yeah six and the super over felt pretty good yeah i think i'd have to go that one yeah semi-final catch or six in the super over. put a poll up on the yeah maybe we'll what, do that we'll put a poll up and see what all us all us blimmin what are we called lounge lizards all us backyard <laughs> all us backyard players all us guys who played until we were 20 and then stopped playing put it up there hey dude thanks so much for coming in look it's uh, even though they stay in broadcasting you're not supposed to acknowledge your mistakes there's been some balls ups today techno- technologically <laughs> i apologize for that i don't know what's going to go on i was going to say i'm going to have have my technical guys head but i'm the technical guy so it's mm. it's on me. So I, I really please don't do that. I really I really appreciate your uh, your, your your grace um, hanging out. But it's been such a lovely time to talk to you. I'd love mm. to talk to you again at some stage. Uh, you know, maybe when you move into your new broadcasting career. Oh, definitely. We can talk I about can, that. I can be your technical guy. Yeah, uh, but <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy Nisham, good luck with the series. I mean, I know that you guys probably wouldn't think this way, but after that win last night, I mean, hopes are high for uh, for a good uh, a good win against the old. Uh, against the old Australians. They must be the favourite to beat for you guys, are they? Do they the for you personally, are they yeah. the ones that you like to knock off? Yeah. Yeah, they are. More than any. Yeah. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you for coming in. Really appreciate it. Thanks to New Zealand Cricket as well. Uh Jimmy Neesham. Uh, appreciate your time. Cool. Thank you.